Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever in the world uh, that you're logging in from. Good afternoon. This good is afternoon. from Nigeria. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi, Heather. Hi, Diab. Hello. It's good to see you all. And uh, welcome to the live seminar of uh, University of West of Scotland in association with Lincoln University of Business and Management in the UAE. It is our pleasure to host seminars like these constantly to ensure that the fraternity of professionals, no matter what your specialization is, continuously grows. The times will keep on changing, but we have to ensure that we are prepared. On that note, I request my team to start sharing uh, the slide, please. Right, so this is the topic of the day. How do we become a team lead superhero with the right qualification in hand? Friends, I must share with you a story here. I am a marketing uh, specialist. Uh, I've majored throughout in marketing and I always disregarded other specialization while I was pursuing my MBA. And the more I got into a uh, general management profile, I realized there is one thing that no, uh, irrespective of what your profile is, no one can do without is project management skills. Can you please change the slide? We have with us four speakers who will be joining us today. We will be joined by uh, uh, Dr. Stain Heckroot. He is the Dean of LUBM UAE. He is quite a, a agile and a passionate uh, academician. And uh, he also mentors and guides several corporate corporations in and around Middle East, Europe, and Africa. We also have with us Dr. Rekha Pillai, she is the research head with us at Lincoln University of Business and Management. And she has over 17 years of teaching experience at various universities in Middle East. Uh, we are also honored to have Mr. Shom Bagh with us. He is a certified PMP and he's a professional. He works, uh, he has an experience of working with several uh, corporations in areas like strategic management, e-commerce, project management, as well as operations. Uh, and of course, myself, I manage the academics and alliances with Lincoln University of Business and Management. Can you please play message by our Dean? Warm welcome. Even though we are in the cloud, as is the world today, a warm, warm welcome to this program in project management, the program through which we guarantee and will definitely enhance your project, man your project management skills. It's a program that's brought to you by Lincoln University of Business and Management here in the heart of Sarja in the UAE in collaboration with the University of West of Scotland. Indeed, an honor the first of its kind. So warm welcome to each and every one of you. Thank you for your flexibility. My sincere apologies that I cannot be live streaming on this day. Unfortunately, I had a clash of schedules. It tends to happen these days with so many things being online and everybody wanting a little bit of time from your time on the cloud. But yeah, you know, I thought at least I could put together a recording to send you my best wishes for this program. 
You might wonder who I am. My name is Stein. My surname is Hekruit. I'm a professor in strategy and leadership. But much more than that, I'm also the dean here at Lincoln University for business and management. As the dean, I'm primarily responsible to look at the academic rigor of the programs that Lincoln University offers to its students. Involved in quality assurances, involved in institutional excellence, and also involved in working with other heads of the academia from the universities that we collaborate with, like the University of West of Scotland. I also engage with students. My email is available. My door is always open. For me, ultimately, it's important that you get as much out of this program as possible. And we're always open for ideas and uh, initiatives, innovative thoughts on how we can make things even better. You have a fantastic administrative team and a support team uh, at Lincoln University. You have a fantastic curriculum, great facilitators, great faculty, people with high levels of expertise. I'll also be teaching on this program, really, really, really looking forward to it. But if all else fails, or if you just want to pay a compliment or make contact, you're always welcome to reach out to me as the Dean of Lincoln University at any given point in time. My area of expertise, uh, I have an interesting history. I did not come through a conventional or traditional road of progress through the academia. I've actually been running uh, my own entrepreneurial enterprises for just a little bit over, well, almost on three decades. Uh, next year, 2022, will be the third decade that I have done this. Started off in my younger years as a consultant, first in strategy, then in leadership, and eventually ended up spending a lot of time on supply chain and implementation. In my lifetime, I've worked in more than 48 different countries on the continent. That's, those are the ones that I could remember and count. One night, my daughter and I decided to make a list of all the countries that I have visited and worked in in my lifetime. I haven't lived in all of them, but I had to travel there as a business consultant to help organizations to implement their strategies on the ground. So I don't have an official qualification in supply chain. I kind of ended up by default because of the fact that I gave strategic advice and often would see how companies struggle to implement it. I eventually ended up much more on the floor than in the boardroom. This implementation brought me in very close contact with project management. In my lifetime as a strategic consultant, you might find it interesting that I've worked in cold storage facilities that we set up in the port of Nigeria. I worked in distribution centers that we set up in Ghana for ShopRite Checkers, which is one of the larger retail stores in South Africa, my home country. I ended up working on the ground. I worked in an ice cream factory of all places where we would, we, we, where we would uh, bring systems and install processes change cultures, change the way in which we do things to optimize efficiency and effectiveness in those organizations. And all of those, of course, had a starting point and an end point, a finish point, a goal that we were chasing. And that was my introduction to project management. Subsequently taken a number of executive programs in project management and I also sometimes teach on project management. So I understand the pillars of project management. There's quality. There's resources, primarily referring to the financial side of things, the cost of it, and then there's time. We recently, here in Dubai, where I, where I have uh, resided now for six years, went through a very difficult calculation whereby we were building up to Expo 2020, one of the largest projects internationally in terms of scope, time, cost, allocation of resources. We started with 45 people working as a small team six years ago and closer to the completion of the project, ended up with almost 5,000 people on that project. Allocation of resources. All because we wanted to finish in time and not compromise on quality. Of course, unfortunately, due to COVID-19 and the pandemic and the lockdowns, the grand opening was severely de derailed. And it makes for a very interesting case study. What do I now do with this project? 
What do I do with all the resources? Do I send them all home? Can I reallocate them? Can I extend the time? What does it do to the quality? So in my lifetime, I've worked on a number of practical projects on the ground, very closely related and very involved with project management. That's why I'm so excited about this program. Now, you might ask me that, you know, if I didn't come through the conventional road of university in terms of my career progress, how did I end up being the dean for Lincoln University of Business and Management? How did I end up being a professor? Well, I kind of fell into teaching by chance. The turn of the century, I was invited by a business school to come and do a keynote because they wanted someone on the MBA to share some practical experiences. They wanted to make the program more practical and not just all academic and theory. And then when I did that, I kind of liked it. And I think I did something right because they invited me back. And so it progressed and eventually I ended up doing complete modules on an MBA. Today, I'm proud to say that I have taught on no less than seven international business schools in my lifetime since the turn of the century. I also work for Harvard Business School uh, publishing here in the region. I'm a Harvard Business Review author. I work for institutions like the Leron Professional Development Institute and of course as Dean for Lincoln University of Business and Management I also teach on a variety of programs that they offer primarily in strategy, business development, value creation, leadership. So really very much looking forward to this. And that's how I ended up in this position. I still run my own business as well. I'm the chief thought leader for a company called Platform for Connected Leadership, a company that works also, also works very closely with Lincoln University in terms of their executive development programs. And that's the role that I play. That's you know a bit of my background. For the rest, uh, very much enjoy what I do. Love working with students, no matter what their age or expertise or experience. Love engaging and really love being a part of seeing how people develop, how their confidence level grows as they get right on top of the courses and the subject matters that they engage in. Now, of course, one might ask the question, you know, why a program in project management? What has changed over the past couple of decades in terms of project management? And why is it today a lone standing program on this level? Well, the reason, of course, is the world today, as we know, it's much more complex than what it was 30 years ago. The kind of projects that we tackle most likely today are all on a global scale, not just regional. So this is not small programs where I have to make some changes on the production line of an ice cream factory anymore. No, these are now complex projects where I have to coordinate globally. I have to work virtually, just like I'm doing this video recording today, as if I'm in the room. You have to manage virtual teams. So project teams that you need to manage today, most likely will be multi-dimensional, multi-national, coming from different parts of the world, multi-skilled, different levels of expertise. And you may not have the honor or the, the privilege, rather, the ease of working with them, physically, face to face, you might have to do it virtually. So project management over the years, over the decades has progressed as one of the key tools, in fact, the key tool when it comes to implementation. Yes, there's supply chain management. I also happen to author in supply chain management. I've had two books that I co-authored so far published by Oxford University Press. And in that we talk about the larger supply chain you know, from start to finish, raw material, sub-assembly, full assembly, warehousing, retail, customer, all the components that's required. But if you break those down, you break those components down, and you go and look at what needs to happen in those respective components, up to a, a lot of detail and depth, it's really project management that's required. That's where you look at time, resources, cost, quality, accountability, into the finite detail. And that's really why it is so important. So for us at Lincoln University, of course, very happy to be working with one of the leading universities, University of West of Scotland, when it comes to this program in project management. Thank you very much for taking the time out to attend today's induction. Again, my apologies for not being able to live stream. I wish you all of the best of luck. And, you know, I must tell you, 
in all the countries that I've traveled to, all the countries that I've traveled in my lifetime, there's a significant difference. I truly believe it's the only differentiator that we have as people. It is those who have the opportunity, the good fortune, the privilege of education, and those who don't. You have that privilege. You have that opportunity, whether you're paying for yourself, whether you have a scholarship, whether you're being paid by the company. Education is the most powerful tool, the biggest game changer that you have. And what a great thing that you can do it through institutions like Lincoln University of Business and Management in collaboration with one of the leading institutions in this field, University of West of Scotland. Thank you very much. Best of luck. Bye-bye. So those are the words from our passionate Dean who not only likes to teach, but also consults with a lot of companies around the world. And we are so proud to be associated with faculty members like these. I also invite Dr. Rekha, who is our research head. Again, very much in love with her profession. She loves to teach, she loves to mentor students, and. I, and we love to see all our professionals grow in their respective field. Dr. Rekha. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Mikhavi, for inviting me. And uh, I too feel delighted to be a part of this journey. Uh, a lovely day to all my viewers today. And uh, I really hope that I will be able to refill your motivational cup by sharing some pearls of inspiration on how a master's in project management from UWS Lincoln can earn you the crown of an accomplished leader. So starting with one of my favorite quotes, the most dangerous leadership myth is that leaders are born, that there is a genetic factor to leadership. That's nonsense. In fact, the opposite is true. Leaders are made rather than born. I love this power-packed wisdom statement, and I request all of you out there to consider this as one of your success mantras, especially during this turbulent phase of uncertainty. It has definitely worked wonders for me. I too lost a plush job last year. It was my dream job. Well, I was not made redundant. I was terminated just because of the fact that I had to travel against policy. I did travel against policy for an emergency health situation. I was crestfallen initially, but my well-wishers inspired me to bounce back with my 17 years of teaching experience and so on. But they told me, Rekha, you have the choice. You need to bounce back, but you need to make a decision as to how you're going to bounce back. And then I thought, well, I have done a lot of activities in my university organized a lot of conferences. And then I thought, aren't these all little projects in the making? So why not earn a certification in project management? Because I already have my PhD and I already have a double master. So I thought of upskilling myself in project management because everything what I did in my university, which was successful as well, was a part of projects. My dear viewers, I know that despite the allure of turning our calendars to 2021, putting behind the most challenging 2020 behind us, this new year too is not going to brush aside our new norms, which are virtual meetings and work from home. That's exactly what we're doing now. But I can say one thing with conviction that this is the ideal time to hone your skills and don the mantle of a leader specifically an agile project leader. My dear aspirants who are watching us today, I'm sure that many of you are into projects. You have your PMP, CAPM, which means you have sufficient uh, theoretical background on uh, um, the knowledge areas, the process group, the processes. But I would like to highlight, quickly highlight, how an MSc in project management can enhance and build on your existing knowledge base 
as well as catalyze your efforts in becoming an efficient, accomplished and effective team leader. I'm going to keep it very simple and to the point. I will be highlighting three golden areas which you must recollect and revisit when you question yourself as to how an MSc in project management can transform you into an accomplished, agile team leader. So here are those golden points. First, well, project management. We're going to talk about project management, uh, the new watchword in post COVID-19 scenario. Our second uh, golden area will be successful agile team leads, which is a new leadership style in the post COVID-19 scenario. And our third will be mastering agile leadership competencies with an MSc in project management from UWS, of course, through Lincoln University. So let's begin our journey uh, with our first golden area. So can you please change the slide? Yeah. All right. So I don't have any power packed slides. I would like you to listen to my beautiful voice. Um, let us begin our journey with our first golden area, which is the relevance of project management post COVID and where the spotlights are currently on. I'm not sure if you have read the latest PMI commissioned talent gap analysis for the period 2017 through 2027 by AEG group. Uh, that's the Anderson's economic group. Well, this report points to outstanding job opportunities for project managers and related designations uh, in 11 countries, to name a few, Australia, UK, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, China, India, Germany, etc. And they also explicitly mentioned that these opportunities are going to be in seven key areas, which are manufacturing and construction, healthcare, information services, publishing, finance and insurance, oil and gas. They also say that an approximate of 22 million jobs, which are project related, are going to be created by 2027. Moreover, think about it. Our invisible best friend, a companion, COVID-19, has completely overhauled the traditional project management practices or traditionally overhauled our existing DNA of a workplace by characterizing it with volatility, uncertainty, and ambiguity. And believe me, curtains are all down on traditional project management practices. And now the focal point are on those leaders who adopt an agile style of project management. Now this agile style is basically a methodology, a collaborative methodology. Uh, which employs short development cycles called sprints. And this methodology incorporates continuous stakeholder and customer feedback throughout the project journey. So it is only through these disciplined, agile project practices uh, that things are going to be sustainable in the long run as it ensures an appropriate balance between flexibility and outlook on project activities, whilst establishing the certainty provided by clear-cut documented plans and control documents. So now that you know the relevance and demand for agile project team leads, let's move on to our second golden area. Team, can you please uh, focus on the second, uh, uh, second golden area, which is um, Yes, mastering agile. Yes, exactly. Mastering agile leader. No, no, that, that's the third one. The second one, my dear, just the previous one. Oh, yes. So you were on that. I'm so sorry. Successful agile team leads, which is a new leadership style in post COVID-19 scenario. Well, um, Forbes released a report on recently on seven traits for a successful team leader, project team leader post COVID-19. And I definitely vouch for them. I'll be definitely adding two of my own as well, which I feel are very important. But let's quickly visit these seven qualities which you all require, especially post COVID. So quickly summarizing the report, it stated that successful team leads are those who can imbibe a clear and candid dose of reality, which is not only effective, but imperative to build a consensus 
within an apprehensive team, especially during COVID and post-COVID. Teams, team leaders, team leads must be efficient communicators who can communicate facts in a reliable and consistent way to, redu to reduce uh, workplace stress and anxiety. Successful team leads should empathize with team leaders, to team members, and they cannot be insensitive to requests, especially during this turbulent phase. Leaders need to manage hybrid teams, virtual teams. Exactly. Look at the team over here. They're so agile. They're managing me. They're managing the, they're managing the whole application, the operations. And all of you are viewing everything seamlessly from around the world. These are all agile practices in happening. The report explicitly disregards ostrich leaders and fosters and they, and, they and they call for agile leaders who fosters agile ways of thinking and working. So future leaders also need to be humble enough to step aside from the podium and let the team members field questions. Lastly, the report says that future successful team leads are actual listeners who shifts gears from listening to respond to listening to understand. So apart from Forbes list, here are my two skills, which I mean, two skills, which I would definitely additionally vouch for. And those are critical thinking and problem solving skills. And last but not the least, humor skills. We'll talk about critical skills later. Humor skills, well, you must be thinking, well, what is a project leader up to do with humor skills? Well, Harvard Business Review shows that team leads with any sense of humor are 27% more motivating and admired than those who don't joke around. I'm sure you don't like to have your leaders having a grumpy face all around. And the employees or the, the, the members or the juniors who work under such team leads are 15% more engaged and their teams are more than twice as likely to solve a creativity challenge. And all of these can translate into improved performance. So my dear participants, start learning the skill of tickling someone's funny bones. It will be very helpful for you, especially post COVID. You as project managers need to reiterate to your team that we are here to be productive, to make a difference and to have fun. That should be your tagline. So now that you know the first two golden areas, which is the relevance of agile project management post COVID and the leadership skills most prized by organizations, let's move on to our third and most important um, golden area, which is mastering these leadership skills, which I just mentioned about with an MSc in project management from UWS. To start with, our semester one modules such as project management fundamentals and projects in practice are organized around project management life cycles and this provides you with solid project management concepts so this will help you to become an informed leader uh, who is abreast of current project management trends and concepts and thus you will be mastering the leadership skills of being credible and reliable with razor edge precision on techniques, process, and procedures. Uh, we have another module known as project risk management, and this will enhance your ability to identify and assess project risks, mitigate threats, and capitalize on opportunities. Successful leaders, as I just mentioned earlier, are comfortable when they challenge their own views in order to make the best of the most objective decisions. One of the true tests of leadership, this is, a, this is another beautiful quote, by the way, by Arnold, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot his surname, Arnold, that one of the true tests of leadership is the ability to recognize a problem before it becomes an emergency. And once again, uh, this, this quote re-emphasizes the mammoth significance of risk identification which you will be mastering with our, with our module project risk management. Our second semester modules, namely change management and leadership will provide you with a framework of concepts and theories of change management and leadership styles 
and they'll give you tips and tools of how you can lead a successful and rewarding organizational change initiative by focusing on two streams, the process or the change model and the transition or the emotional impact when embarking on a change effort. Our modules, you know, the, this is a really beautiful module which you will be having called Case Studies in Project Management and Strategic Project Management and Sustainability. Very, very beautiful modules. Well, these modules will help you to gain the knowledge from key players in project management industry. And they, they will utilize their real world experience to help you to combine cutting edge research with practice. You will be addressing complex multifaceted case studies with solutions that require a thorough situational analysis and strategic thinking, thereby emulating real life challenges or, real, or thereby emulating moreover real life leaders who are faced with similar challenges that require the ability uh, to consider the needs of many diverse stakeholders in their decision making. You also have modules like research methodology and project management dissertation. And this will sharpen your analytical skills, another very imperative skill for team leads. You will be required to craft compelling arguments, defend them against criticism, and justify your decisions with data. And this is going to encourage you to think differently about problems. Challenge new ideas and validate them through evidence, thus assisting you to hone your problem solving and analytical skills. Once again, as I told you, which is an imperative of, uh, imperative of uh, a trait of a successful project leader or team leader. Now, all the modules in the program you're going to study will give you a chance to improve your communication skills by constructing written arguments and participating in classroom discussions. As a leader, you will be using these skills to deliver compelling communication to motivate your own teams, to respond to problems, to engage your employees, and effectively relay or relate your strategic vision. Furthermore, you will be working with people from a variety of culture and background, and surrounding yourself with diverse minds, opinions, and culture will give you a broader perspective and increase your cross-cultural competency and awareness. And guess what? Research has attested that humor skills can be acquired and polished with cross-cultural interaction. So you will be listening and viewing it different, you know, students coming from different culture, the way the mannerisms, the body language, which might tickle your funny bone as well. Not to offend anybody, but this is a way we need to take life very simple, very sweet. We need not criticize at every moment, take life beautifully as it is. Now, all this, and apart from all this, you will be participating in many collaborative projects and breakout sessions during your classes. And this will encourage you to cooperate and solve complex problems in real life. This environment which we are providing you will help embody the collective nature of leadership and illustrate the importance of failing and succeeding together. You will learn to listen to the views of others, experience different work ethics and delegate effectively. As a leader in the real world, you will be able to utilize all these skills to inspire a shared vision and enable others to act. Finally, upon your beautiful and wonderful and most looked upon graduation, you will be prepared to address the challenges of leading international projects whilst maintaining ethical and professional standards throughout a project life cycle. Well, this is all what I have with me today because I'm given only 15 minutes to talk. And might as well that you are aware of all these three golden areas. Why not ponder over these to reassure yourself that a project management from UWS through Lincoln University will definitely be a game changer in your career path as it not only develops a full-fledged project management professional, but also an established, outstanding and sought after leader. 
this is all from my side and I hope your motivational cup is pretty full by now. Let's part with another beautiful quote. When it is obvious, please move on to the last slide team. Yes, thank you. When it is obvious that the goals cannot be reached, do not adjust your goals, adjust your action steps. These are some beautiful pearls of wisdom by Confucius. So put on your thinking caps as to how you can adjust your action steps for elevating yourself into a successful leader with an MSc in project management from UWS through Lincoln University. Thank you so much for listening and hope to see you all very soon in our classes. Thank you. Stay safe and be happy. Keep smiling. Thank you, Ms. Mikhavi. Thank you so much, Dr. Rekha. I completely agree with your thoughts uh, and especially the final slide that no matter what happens, uh, the goals should never be compromised with. All we have to do is probably rethink on how do we alter uh, and you know adapt to the changing environment and what needs to be innovated uh, and changed in terms of our approach. On that note, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Shom, and he is going to present with us today a wonderful case study that he has been involved with. He's a practitioner. We are thoroughly honored to have him today. And he's going to share his experience of how he has successfully understood and delivered a certain project. Mr. Shom, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And thank you for the, all the brilliant perspective that I just heard from Dr. Rekha and the energy of Professor Stein. It's really brilliant. Thanks for having me. So my name is Sean Bog and I have been working for, uh, you know, large multinationals. So I'm going to bring in uh, the industry perspective. Uh, in terms of the project management today, and specifically in the area that has been revolutionized last year. As a result, it has been born out of the consumer behavior, uh, which is the e-commerce area. Um, I have my areas of expertise are strategic management, project management, product management, and demand generation. Uh, and in the last six years, I've been working very closely with the e-commerce business. So. What we'll do essentially today is we're gonna have a conversation. It's not just gonna be a monologue. Uh, it's gonna be a dialogue. So we're gonna have some interaction uh, while we go along. And initially what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put you uh, in perspective in terms of the e-commerce uh, ecosystem in the Middle East and North Africa, the region where we live in and how that is changing. That particular ecosystem is changing. And because of the change, uh, project management, how that's becoming more and more relevant. So I'm going to speak on that at length, uh, you know, uh, uh, from now on onwards, and we're going to be having an interactive session. So next slide, please. Right, so this is going to be our agenda. So uh, we're going to look into setting the scene uh, for the e-commerce industry in MENA first, we're going to, where we're going to look about the change in the business environment. We're going to take a global benchmark and a regional deep dive. Uh, then we're going to have an online user habit. And then we're going to look at the categories, different high volume categories inside e-commerce, how those are changing. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Then we're going to look at, uh, you know, an actual use case uh, of a project that we have had. We be changing some names, et cetera, because it's uh, a, a confidential end user project, but uh, you know you will definitely get the nuggets of value and all the skills of project management that were used to deliver the project within the scope, uh, time, and cost. And then we're going to talk about, uh, in conclusion, the future of e-commerce uh, in 2021 in the Middle East, and as project managers, how we can engage and uh, you know both help our own careers as well as the customers. Finally, I've also brought in the re recruiter perspective. What is the industry looking for, uh, for a project manager? You know, what are the key skills that you need to have to be successful as a project manager? So these are the things that we're gonna speak about uh, from now onwards. So let's move on to the next slide. 
Right. So we're going to come up with, uh, you know, a very, very uh, technical definition first, but people have already spoken about it. So this is the definition from the Project Management Institute, which is the apex body of project management in the United States and globally. So project is essentially a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product. And the word is important, unique product, service, or result. Uh, so we're going to look at some of the projects. What are the, uh, what, are the, what are the examples of projects? So here we go. So developing a vaccine for COVID-19, for example, that's a project. It's a unique project. Or construction of a building like Taj Mahal, or where, when there was no PMP, or there was no MSC in project management, but the thought was there, or like Burj Khalifa. Renovating a kitchen, something smaller at home, uh, you know, designing a new transportation uh, uh, vehicle, acquiring a new or modified data system, and organizing a meeting, something uh, we think is simple. But all of these are unique endeavors that require project management skills. It requires engaging with different stakeholders. Uh, so that, that's, that's a project. And implementing a new business process is another example of what a project would be. Next slide, please. So here I thought to define what projects are not and what projects are. So for example, as we spoke about, projects are temporary in nature. So they have a definitive beginning and end. Uh, unlike you know, operations that are repetitive in nature, projects are unique. So they are new undertakings, uh, unexplored ground. Uh, whereas uh, in operations, they have a continuum, right? So we continue to do the operational work uh, on a daily basis. Now, at this particular point in time, you shouldn't think that project management is something that's really glamorous and operations is not. That's not the case. They just do different things and both are required uh, by the enterprises. So it's very important to know that they are two different things. And it's important for us to recognize which are projects and which are operations. And that's the reason why we're showing this particular slide. Uh, and again, further, the projects are characterized by a new product, you know, a service or process that hasn't existed before. It's a completely new endeavor in an objective to be achieved. Uh, and once that's done, the project is terminated. So a project is, has a starting point and has an end point. It's got systems to be created. It's got performance, cost, and time that are uncertain. Uh, it involves sometimes upsetting the status quo. What does it mean? So it means that uh, a project in, in a project the, with the level of uncertainties, you're so, you, I mean, project ma as a project manager, you're supposed to challenge the status quo on a daily basis. And that happens you know, on a daily basis in an organization. And uh, one of the reasons why Agile, Dr. Rekha spoke about Agile, right? So Agile, well, the reason why it came up is the fact that there are constant change in scopes and uh, uh, a very hard-coded planning system was not really delivering results. Uh, on the other side, uh, you know, operations is a repeat process. We've got multiple objectives. The systems are already created. Uh, the performance cost and time are sort of defined. And uh, uh, supporting the status quo is, is a hallmark of operation. And sort of having fewer risks in operation. Whereas project involves significant risk management as well as mitigation of risk. So that's very important as a project manager you have to constantly look for risk because in a project environment being so uncertain, uh, there would be risks. And as a project manager, you have to identify and mitigate the risk. Yeah. Next slide, please. This is one of my uh, you know, favorite slides in terms of you know, what really governs the life of a project manager. So the project manager's key KPIs are driven out of three things. And I think the participants earlier have spoken about it. So project is about the scope. It's about the schedule or time. And it's about the cost. And at the heart of every project is the quality. So it's, it's a fine balance. It's about you know, managing all these three attributes carefully to deliver the quality. That really is a hallmark of a fantastic project. And also the KPIs of the project managers are actually born out of the triangle of Triple constraints. So always keep this in mind. Uh, you know whether you are actually doing a project or doing a simple thing at in the in the home. For example, if you're shifting uh, your home, that could be a small project. And in that, there would be a scope, there would be a time, and there would be cost. And at the heart of all of it would be 
quality that you, you're happy with that you know transfer of your home for example something very simple but what i'm trying to drive home is the fact that project management is a mindset and in that these three attributes are really critical so uh, keep in mind these things as, as we go along next slide please so uh, let's uh, you know take some time to look into this particular slide it's not complicated for the ones of you who have seen this for the first time this is uh, you know project management institute has something called pimbok or project management body of knowledge so it basically is a matrix that uh, is talking about five uh, steps on on the, on the on the horizontal so you have got the process steps from initiating planning executing monitoring and control and closing and matrixing against that are 10 knowledge areas of integration scope time cost quality human resource communication risks procurement and stakeholder management. So all of these are essential ingredients of managing a project. And uh, you know, over here you will see about 44 different processes that are matrix between these two, uh, from the, uh, between the groups and between the knowledge areas. And right now in the seventh edition of the PIMBOK, there are 49 of them. So starting with, for example, in the initiating, you've got two of them. Developing, developing a project charter. So which is basically, you know, putting the blueprint of the project. Very, very critical. Looking at everything, a 360 perspective of a project manager, you know, goes into actually developing a really uh, stellar project charter. And uh, second of all is the planning bit, you know, where you do uh, integration planning, uh, scope planning, uh, time planning, and then, you know, you do a work breakdown structure. You break down basically a work into smaller bits and you pass it on to different stakeholders. So they execute it seamlessly. Similarly, there is quality, resource, communication planning, procurement planning, stakeholder planning. I wouldn't get into all of these, but just to give you a flavor that project management is about thinking systematically. It, it, once you learn project management, do an MSc in project management or you know, do a PMP certification or Prince to whatever it is, it basically puts you in perspective in terms of what is the entire game plan, what all you have to, you know, uh, you know, what all you have to think about, uh, you know, to execute a project seamlessly, uh, profitably, and on time. So this, all of these things go into doing that. So I thought of putting this particular slide. It looks complex, but all of these are different ingredients of project management. Yeah. Moving on to the next one. Right, so why project management skills are vital to organizations and individuals like all of you and me. So inside being a large corporation, you know, uh, increasingly the project management is becoming a very critical function and uh, not because, you know, it's, some, it's because it's a fad, but organizations are looking for employees who can make the organizations more effective more productive and more profitable. And to do that, they're looking for the project management skills. So project management skills are helping you provide that leadership. It's very, very important. Uh, they're, they're looking uh, for you to balance the key priorities in the organization between, you know, between the market shares, between the profitability, between the brand objectives, uh, managing the customers in a difficult uh, you know, business environments like the one that we are in right now. Uh, it also helps you oversee different resources, resources in sales and marketing, resources in supply chain, resources in finance, corporate labs, customers. Uh, so how do you actually bring them all together towards a common and a well-defined goal? How do you actually do that? So project management helps you build those skills, which will uh, help you deal with so many different kinds of resources and make them do what they should be doing. Uh, and also it helps you, you know, attract your progress towards the goal. So one thing that, uh, you know, you will see once you become a project manager inside a company is that you're one step closer to the management. You're becoming a manager from a technical area. For example, if you're an engineer or if you're a supply chain person, from there, how would you actually, uh, you know, progress to become a manager? How would, the, how would you tell the organization that these are the things that I bring to the table, to the organization. And when you do the project management, you actually rediscover yourself, right? 
and the companies are valuing it very, very significantly. In fact, in all the job posts for the project management, you will see that it's coming under general management. So while you are a specialist in a particular area, like an engineer or uh, you know, a pharmacy pro a professional, a supply chain or a finance professional, but to bring it all together and create the magic, it's very important that you are a skilled, qualified project manager. So that's the objective of this particular slide in terms of how you actually, you know, how it can really further your career inside an organization. That's an inside view. Right, so we'll move on to uh, today's topic that we spoke about, uh, that project management unlocking value in e-commerce within our region, within the region that we live and work. So as we've all seen in the last year, you know, uh, there's been a serious change in the business environment. May it be change in technology, consumer taste, competitive behavior, uh, resource prices, local rules, everything has changed. And, uh, you know, we have never lived in that kind of a situation for all our lives. And the last time people actually faced it was almost 100 years back in 1918, when there was another pandemic that hit the world. And uh, this time around, even being you know, so advanced in terms of technology and so many other things, the world was actually caught uh, completely unaware, I would say, in many areas. But one of the things that really has come out of it as, as, as you know, human beings being resilient, uh, they have found something good out of it. And I think e-commerce is one of the good outcomes of the COVID. So as you can see, the retail industry in the Middle East and North Africa is on the threshold of a paradigm shift. E-commerce is becoming a reality, reinventing customers' purchase journeys, and all of us have been those customers, right? We've been Amazon Prime customers, et cetera, forming compelling customer experiences, disrupting business models and creating exponential journeys, you know, growth opportunities for retailers as well as for e-commerce pure, pure players. We have seen, you know, companies like Carrefour, competing with the likes of Amazon as well with the Carrefour now. So everybody is understanding that e-commerce is something that is born out of a very, very serious change in consumer behavior. So it's clearly is while this change is happening, every change creates an opportunity. And one of the opportunity obviously is the prospects of uh, employment, jobs, and which kind of jobs? There are various kinds of jobs inside uh, e-commerce, but one of the very valued jobs inside the e-commerce industry is of project management. So I just want to you know, drive that point home as we are on this particular slide. Next one, please. Uh, this is one of, our, one of my, I think, uh, a good slide, and I really love data, so I thought of throwing a lot of data at you today. So. As you can see in this particular slide that, uh, you know, there's some major changes that have happened even before COVID, right? 2017, Amazon took an important uh, position in the Middle East. They acquired Stoop.com for $580 million. And you can see the growth of the e-commerce business while the physical retail business, the offline retail business is growing single digit. The e-commerce business is growing very high double digit. So CAGR is, compounded annual growth rate. So you can see the compounded annual growth rate of the e-commerce industry from 2014 to 2017 in the Middle East and North Africa has grown by 25% from 4.2 billion US dollars to 8.3 billion dollars. And in 2020, it's jumped to 19 billion US dollars, which means there are 19 billion US dollars of transactions that have happened on e-commerce in Middle East and North Africa. And that's really phenomenal in terms of how this industry is growing. So, uh, you know, at this particular point in time, I would like to have, I'd like to have a preview. Uh, and I think we'll put on the first question to uh, the, uh, you know, uh, to everybody. And the question is essentially, you know, uh, can I see the question? Can you guys put forth? I can't see the question here. Yeah, so what project management methodology is the de facto standard in the UK and is used in over 50 countries? So just put your perspective, you know, and we'll discuss it later, but which is the de facto standard in United Kingdom for project management? So please put your answers and we'll discuss it a bit later.
We'll give it another five seconds. Right. So the answer actually is PRINCE2. So PRINCE2 is the de facto standard in the UK and is used in over 50 countries all over the world. In the United States, it's PMP. And in the UK, it's basically the PRINCE2. Thank you very much. Can we move back to the deck? So this particular slide is the, the follow-up slide, and it's again a lot of data, and just try to see how we read this particular slide. So as you can see in this particular slide, we're talking about e-commerce penetration in the regions. So on the, on the left-hand side, you have the United Kingdom, US, and France, the developed countries, where you have $15.6 out of $100 spent uh, on e-commerce, right? So typically, as you can see, they're fairly high. So 15% of the retail sales are e-commerce, and that's what we call the e-commerce penetration. Whereas in Russia, Brazil, and Turkey, which are emerging moderate growth countries, it is around 4.5% or so. And the emerging high countries, high growth countries like China, it is almost comparable to the UK. It's about 13.8%. And it's much higher if you consider the consumer to consumer uh, you know, e-commerce. Uh, similarly, in India, it's growing 2.4% with Amazon coming in. And again, it's, it's you know, uh, it, it, it's growing phenomenally. In MENA, however, it's only 1.9%. Uh, in GCC, overall, it's 3%. It's better, of course. And with UAE leading at 4.2%, Saudi with 3.8%, and so on. So what does it show? Uh, this is an important point. This, this particular slide makes a point. And the point is that e-commerce is going to be a very, very high growth engine. It's going to drive this economy and a lot of job creation are going to happen around the e-commerce. So that's the point we want to drive home in this particular slide, that there is a massive room for growth as e-commerce penetration in Middle East and North Africa remains compared to be lower as compared to other regions, which means they're gonna grow significantly, yeah? So that's the point uh, I wanna drive home. And what does it mean? It also means for the job for the job seekers, it means that you have to upskill and you have to reskill. And one of those skills is project management. Yeah, so moving on to the next slide, right. This is another interesting slide that talks about the category wise projection in the e-commerce industry. So for example, there are four big ticket categories in e-commerce, right? So you've got electronics, you've got fashion, you've got grocery, you've got beauty, and all of these have touch points in our lives, right? Whether men or women, we have already purchased products from these categories. And as you can see that they are significantly growing. So electronics is by far the biggest right now with $2.9 billion and going to be 6.4 billion by 2022 next year. Fashion is going to be 5.7, grocery is going to be 4.5, very big. And this is going to be a very big one because look at the growth from 0 0.2 to 4.5 billion. So that's going to be a very significant growth driver in the e-commerce space. So <clears throat> this is a basically a drill down view that what is inside e-commerce, which are those verticals inside e-commerce which are gonna grow exponentially. So as you can see that electronics is already, <laughs> already pretty big, but also fashion is uh, closely a close second. Grocery is in number three and beauty is also you know, very, very strong. And uh, what's gonna happen in the Middle East is that uh, you know, the customers are, there is a lot of offline inertia, right? We have with the best malls in, uh, in Dubai and Riyadh and Kuwait, and in Cairo and all these all these cities. And uh, because of that, the consumer behavior is a bit different. And we like to touch and feel products before we buy it. But COVID has changed all of that. And that's gonna bring in the customers onto the online portal, which they already have last year. 
So these, these numbers are probably going to grow a, a tad further, maybe 10% more as, as we go into 2022. So as you can see that if you are interested in a specific domain, if you want to look at a specific uh, e-commerce area like fashion, so if you're looking at Namshi, if you're going to work for Namshi, then you know that this is what you need to look at. If you are looking at the aggregators, you know, for example, uh, you know, uh, Zomato, for example, who are delivering the food. That's a very, very important business in the COVID time. You know, how can you enter that particular business and uh, how can you become a project manager and uh, further your career in that particular area? So this particular slide gives you a category by wise view of the e-commerce. Uh, so I thought it, it might just make sense or be something interesting in terms of uh, what you're looking for. Right, moving on to the next slide. Right, so what is uh, this slide essentially talks about all the different disciplines inside the e-commerce. So the first one, of course, while building an e-commerce business, the first one is, of course, about the heart of it is customer, right? But you want to build a software component and a hardware component. You're going to have, uh, you know, a payment process, a payment gateway to process the payments. There's going to be logistics and last mile delivery. And of course, as I was speaking about, the customer experience and the customer acquisition, the product management is another piece. So to make all these things work together and create the magic like um, the way Amazon has done worldwide, they need a lot of project managers, many, many project managers, not just one. They would need hundreds and thousands of project managers to actually make it happen. And it, it's a focus area for Amazon uh, particularly, but you also have known you also have, uh, you know, uh, outside the Middle East, in Turkey, you've got large homegrown e-commerce companies like, uh, you know, Hepsi Barada uh, and other players. Uh, in South Africa, you have Take a Lot. Uh, you've got Conga in Kenya, etc. So they are slowly mushroom mushrooming all over the Middle East and Africa region, which basically shows us that this is the time for us as job seekers to take a position. And how do we take the position? By essentially getting ourselves qualified in project management, which you know the speakers even before me spoke about. So that's the point I want to drive home here. Moving on to the next slide. Right, so what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna take on a project. We have changed things a bit, changed names and uh, because of customer confidentiality, so we're going to see, uh, you know, what happens in a project, what happens in an e-commerce project, and how actually we can learn. Uh, it's not, it's not everything that I can talk about it today in this particular project, but you get, you get nuggets of information, you get pearls of wisdom from this particular deck, and you can actually later, uh, you know, you get a flair of it, and you know what to expect if you're a project manager in, in future. So this is a project team which has got a project manager, a marketing expert a business analyst and a web developer. And the next slide, please. So <laughs> the project basically entails coming up with a centralized e-commerce website for a company called NFS Furniture in the United Kingdom. So that's the scope of work for the project team. Yeah, moving on. Right, so the first thing that I sort of uh, you know, projected to you in the slide, in the Pimbox slide, the project management uh, in a body of knowledge slide, which spoke about different process groups and knowledge areas. One of the first thing is to scope the project. You know, what is the blueprint of the project? And here are the few things that the customers brief the project team. So MFS has 10 physical furniture stores in Yorkshire in UK. So it's a regional player there. In order to expand business, they need online selling systems. Yeah, so they've been already uh, offline and they haven't established business there. However, uh, in line with the growing change in consumer behavior, they want to have an online presence. Uh, MFS management then need an e-commerce centralized website as a result. Yeah. Moving on, so they're essentially three main stages that this particular project team thought of. The first one is the pre-stage planning. The second one being the e-commerce design and implementation. The third being the capacity building and support. So these are the three areas that the team would be working on. 
<clears throat> so in terms of the three stage planning, which is very, very critical and the importance of these, this particular step can never be overstated because uh, this can really make or mar a good project. So let's look at the requirement analysis. The requirement analysis that came from the client is the client requirement list, a technical analysis, a stakeholder analysis, a risk analysis, then went on to an activity planning and Gantt chart, uh, a budget preparation, a cost benefit analysis. Yeah, this is what the research, uh, the project team thought were critical in uh, the pre-stage plan. Moving on, next slide please. Yeah, so the client requirement list further went on to the custom registration, yeah. Uh, the customer registration process. So for example, the customers would visit the site, they will register with the important details. So for example, let's say you're a prime customer. So you're registering on Amazon. So you give you all your key details, right? Name, uh, email address, phone number, and other details. Uh, function of the customers, product catalog. That's an important thing. What are we selling in uh, out there and how that's going to change the perceptions of the customers who are visiting. Are we are we completely you know uh, shaping uh, you know the require the are, are we completely meeting the requirements of the customers? Then the shopping cart that's an important thing you know shopping cart is very important because uh, that is a key KPI in e-commerce shopping cart management and shopping cart abandonment rate is an important KPI for the e-commerce companies and how they manage the customer expectations. Uh, the shipping the product finally, once people buy the product, then it's about fulfilling activities. Uh, how do we do that seamlessly? What is the payment gateway experience? You know, that is another important thing. A lot of people fall off in e commerce platforms if they have a patchy payment experience. Yeah. Social media integration. For example, the brands that are playing in the e commerce, uh, for example, this particular player who's, who's playing in the, in the e commerce or who wants to play in the e commerce space. What is their social assets? What are their social assets that they have around the e-commerce? How can they drive traffic from those social assets like Facebook, like Instagram, like all of these social assets? How can they bring the traffic onto their brand page, onto uh, you know, where people would come, do the research, and then finally uh, you know, do the conversion or they finally you know, buy, the, uh, buy the product? And then an administrative panel you know, to manage the entire thing. So in terms of technical analysis, uh, there was design standards uh, that they thought of doing, uh, testing standards and delivery standards. The three things that they thought of working on in terms of technical analysis. Yeah, moving on. So the first thing is the stakeholder analysis. This is very, very important. And I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, not, uh, I'm just uh, repeating it because this is uh, the first stepping stone of uh, project management to understand who we are working with and their internal stakeholders as well as external stakeholders. So as you can see in this particular uh, in this particular slide, the, the stakeholders can be of different types. The high power, low interest, the low power, low interest, low power, high interest, and high power, high interest. So in an organization, for example, who are the high power, low interest? The senior management, regulators, and service providers. Who are the high power, high interest, the owners, the customers, CEO, partners, and e-vision. What it essentially says is what kind of influence these people are going to exert on the project. This is something that's very important to understand that what's going to be the influence of these people. So it's important to categorize them as clever, intelligent project managers. It's important to understand how are we going to manage these people how, would, how are we going to manage the expectations to ensure that we have their buy-in at all points in, in the project process? Yeah. <clears throat> Moving on. Right. So we discussed when we were discussing the slide about project as well as you know the uh, operations. Uh, we spoke about that the projects will always have inherent risk because it's a unique endeavor. It has not happened before. Right, it is something that has happened for the first time. It's going to happen for the first time. It's going to have certain inherent risks, and those risks, if they are not dealt with, if they're not mitigated, those can really, uh, you know, throw the project out of gear. 
So for example, in this particular case, you know, you, I, you know what they have basically listed down are different risks. For example, let's look at some of the risks. The first risk is misunderstanding the client requirement. This could be a very big risk and it does happen, especially if you're working in a virtual environment. It can happen, things can get lost in translation that what can happen. So as you can see, this particular project, uh, if you actually miss the client requirement, the impact is high. The probability is medium and it could be high, especially if you're not on site, if you're actually working uh, you know, uh, uh, virtually across the world, this can happen. So in terms of priority, this is number one. And what is the <coughs> mitigation plan? They have put a mitigation plan. Similarly, inappropriate staffing, inadequate security, you know, exceeding schedules and budgets, teams lack of general expertise. So all of these have been earmarked as critical risks and they have impact and most of them are high impact risks, which means that if these are not mitigated, they, uh, they can really, you know, throw the uh, project completely haywire and they've given a probability risk. Now, some people, some project managers in risk analysis use a Six Sigma tool called FME. It's called uh, FMEA, fail failure mode analysis. So in failure mode analysis, what they do is that they look at every high impact risk and they come up with something called an RPN or risk priority number. They actually prioritize what is the number one risk, number two risk and number three risk. And what are the plans to mitigate those, those risks? So it's very important for you know, uh, a project manager to understand what are the major risks and how we deal with those. And to do that, you're going to put them in uh, you know, a slide like this or an Excel file like this and work with a tool like an FMEA tool, for example, that would uh, completely uh, you know, uh, give you a, a, a full picture of the risk. And then uh, with your team, you can work on how we can go, go ahead and mitigate those risks. Moving on. Right. So the next thing in project management is activity planning. And uh, we briefly saw it in the, in the PIMBOK chart that it, it's, it's a part of the, uh, well, one of the uh, processes. And what, what basically means that project is a lot of things, you know, the different people doing different things, but as project manager, you will have to break down everything into a bite size. So it, it's something that people will be able to actually review and digest and then execute. And it's called basically in the, in the PIMBOK jargon, it's called the WBS or work breakdown structure. And to do that, you need to do an activity planning. It basically involves a time milestone and which are finally broken down by weeks. So who's doing what and when? So it's, it's very important to you know, get this kind of a scheduling uh, done to ensure that who's working when and also it helps you to allocate the resources, right? So this is the flavor of how the activity planning is done. And it can, you can do it on Excel. You can also do it on MS Project. So the, you can, uh, there are other tools like Jira. So there are a lot of different tools where you can do the activity planning, but essentially what it tells a project manager is that how can he deploy his resources most efficiently so that he gets the best out of them, yeah? Moving on. Yeah, so same thing, it's an extension of that. So you can actually deploy uh, MS project for, uh, for those of you who are familiar. Microsoft has uh, you know, a software uh, for project management. It's called MS project. Uh, so if you get take a license for MS, MS project, uh, you can actually work on doing an activity planning on MS project. This is an example, it's a screenshot, not a very good one, but it's a screenshot that tells you who's doing what and when. So as a project manager, you have to review it every morning that you come to work in terms of who is doing what, when, what's finishing, what's starting. Certain tasks are finishing and those finishes are important because when those tasks end, something else begins. So there's a relationship with those and those you can visualize very, very cleverly when you're looking at a Gantt chart, for example, which are generated by the MS project. So I thought of giving you a not very good screenshot, but it gives you an idea of what it is. It's not that complex. Uh, MS project actually helps you visualize the entire thing very, very easily. So once you learn the MS project, it can take two weeks. Uh, a small training may help you, uh, you know, get up to speed. 
But once you learn it, you can actually deploy and you can uh, do a very good activity planning uh, in this particular fashion. Moving on. Look, a project management a manager need not be a specialist, but a project manager needs to know a little bit of everything. He needs to know a little bit of finance, a little bit of marketing, a little bit of supply chain, a bit of uh, you know how to do estimations, etc. So one of the things for this particular project was to do uh, you know their their cost, how the costs are spanning out over so many years, the higher level and the lower level. So as you can see in the year one. The higher side of the cost was 161,000 pounds. The lower side was 149,000 pounds. So as a project manager, you have to estimate what are the cost of an organization to do every activity to sell online, there's a cost, right? So you have to estimate what's going to be a cost. It, it could be a rough estimation. It could be a range, but you have to have an estimation of the project manager that to develop. Uh, so this particular company is developing a new route to market, right? So it's going to have, it already has retail stores. Now it's coming up with an online store. So online store is going to have its own revenue. But to run that online operation, what kind of cost is going to incur? So this particular slide tells you the budgeting of that cost. Moving on to the next slide. Yeah. So another important thing in project management is doing a careful cost benefit analysis for three years or five year period or whatever. So for example, in this case, as you can see the benefit that this particular uh, furniture company is gonna have from an uh, online presence is gonna be 1.2 million pounds, right? That's gonna be the sales. The cost that it would incur to run this particular operation is gonna be like 760,000 pounds. Therefore, to subtract the benefit and the cost, you get the profit. So it's gonna, there's gonna be a projected net profit of 463,000 pounds. So as a project manager, one needs to understand that what is the impact, what is the financial impact of a project uh, of the client. So if the client is managing this particular, going to a new new route, uh, go, taking a new route to market, what are the different revenues that he's going to generate? And to do those, what are the costs he's going to incur? So this is important to give it to the senior management because they're going to allocate the resources. So they're going to see these kind of studies. And as a project manager, you've got to work with different functions like finance, uh, uh, you know, and other uh, specialists to come up with these kind of, uh, you know, estimations to present while you're doing the project. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah. So this is kind of, a, you know, a different kinds of uh, cost benefit analysis studies that people do. For example, for this project, the cost for the five years, 760,000. The net profit they're expecting is 463,000. So there's a return on the investment, the return on the capital employed of 0 0.61, which is basically the profit divided by the cost. You get an ROI. And they also look at other cost benefit analysis, uh, you know, calculations like IRR which is the internal rate of return, which talks about, you know, what is the return of this particular project uh, over how many years, uh, payback period. For example, let's say, you know, you deploy a particular, uh, you know, air conditioning system in your house, which is going to cost you 110,000, uh, you know, just saying, let's say dirhams in a, in a warehouse, let's say, and you're going to get a benefit of 55,000 dirhams every year from it. So it will take you two years for that investment to pay back. So that's in, in a very rough way to make you understand what is the payback period. There's also net present value. That's another important cost benefit analysis. This a project manager will have to do to ensure that the project is profitable, which is very important because you're running, you're working in a, not in a non-profit organization always, but in this case, you're working with a, a, an enterprise, right? That's got profit objectives. So all these things have to be established while you're working with the team at the client end. Moving on, the next thing that they have done is they have kind of shown a break-even point. So the break-even point basically in business is a point in a, in a business. When you're starting a business, there is a point in terms of the volume of products you're selling and the sales of products you're selling. There is a point where you're not making a profit or a loss. It's a very important point to estimate that after how many years or after at what amount of sales when I generate or what volumes I generate, will I reach this particular point? So these project managers have estimated and demonstrated that at 147,000 uh, pounds and after one year, 
this particular company or this e-commerce operation will reach the break-even point. Yeah. Moving on. Right. So the second stage, as we were talking about, was e-commerce development. So we did all the estimations, the finance work, we did the stakeholder management, we did the activity planning. The next one is e-commerce development, actually developing the site. And uh, Dr. Rekha was speaking about the agile, right? Uh, it's a very important topic now. Everybody's talking about it. Some people know it, others don't know it. So I want to talk a little bit about it. So uh, agile is a philosophy and it has come out of software development. So before agile, uh, you know, was uh, there, uh, they, they had other, other methodologies also. Now agile can be deployed. Agile can be practiced used, using a few tools. One of them is Scrum. The other one is Kanban. So Agile, just understand this. Agile is basically a philosophy that can be deployed using either Scrum or can be deployed using something like Kanban or also a hybrid, like some people call it Scrum Band, which is, uh, you know, it's a hybrid between Scrum and Kanban. So just understand that Agile basically is a light management process. To, it, it helps you work in a changing business environment that we are in. It, and uh, the thing is, it also helps you work with self-motivated teams. That, that's very important and makes the team more productive. And uh, before this came in, there was another process called Waterfall, which was uh, you know, hard-coded and it required a lot of initial planning, but then that produced a lot of wrong products because the customer requirements are changing and that waterfall did not really, it was, it was rigid enough not to have, you know, any change management process. So Agile basically brought in the flexibility that was required. Moving on. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, Agile concept is becoming increasingly popular in e-commerce. So uh, this is basically deployment of Agile using Scrum. So as you can see over here, Scrum is basically a process where it has three different rituals, three different uh, you know, roles, and three different processes. So as you can see, the first one on the left one is the product owner. So product owner is the person who defines what kind of product we are trying to produce for the customer. So he has done all his research. He's done the voice of customer. So he's going to uh, basically put the product blueprint in terms of ranking list of what is required, features, stories, et cetera. And then there's gonna be a Scrum Master. Who's Scrum Master? Scrum Master is basically a servant leader. Scrum Master is basically going to make the product happen along with his team, the Scrum team, right? So these are the three main roles, the product owner, the Scrum Master, and the team. And these are the things that they basically practice so uh, the documents that they have is the product backlog, of, case, of course, which is the blueprint of the product, the sprint planning meeting. So before you get into the sprint, there is a sprint backlog. And then there's a breakdown chart, which is basically what comes out of the sprint. So sprint is basically you take one product and uh, take one idea, and then you work on one to four weeks, in some cases, five to seven weeks. And then every day you run daily scrums. And after 24 hours, you basically find out what have you done, what can be tweaked, what went well, what did not. So it's a very agile process. It, it lets you, you know, change things if they're not going right. This was not the case with the waterfall. So this is working very well in the e-commerce development process and the current team deployed it. So I just want to let you know that this is something, this is one of the main skills right now in project management is developing, becoming a scrum, uh, you know, scrum professional to understand how you can work towards delivering products using the Scrum methodology, which deploys the Agile philosophy. Moving on. Right, so this is how, you know, just get some examples of how the team works. So there's a bright idea. Every the team meeting happens, something comes up. Uh, there's a problem solving session that goes on. Something needs to be tested and analyzed and then it's to be delivered finally. So that's how the, the Scrum team works, essentially, in a very agile manner, in a very collaborative manner. Different kind of people in from various functions are coming and becoming part of the team, which is led, led by the Scrum master, who's collaborating uh, with the product owner. So these are the people who are coming together and executing this particular process. Moving on.
Right. So over here, uh, before this, we probably can run the second question, which probably you missed. I don't know if you can run the second uh, question that we have. And it's probably relevant at this particular point in time. Yeah, so let's say the Scrum team has 10 stakeholders, the 10 people who are in the Scrum team, including the product owner, the Scrum master, and the entire team, so the 10 people. So how many communication channels, in your opinion, would be there if there are 10 stakeholders in a project team? It's an interesting, uh, and I want to pick your brains on this. How many do you think it would be? You have 10 seconds and we'll have an answer in 10 seconds. Right, so the correct answer is 45. 45 is the right answer. And there is a formula which basically, you know, uh, can be applied over here. And uh, it's n, n minus one by two, correct? That's right. So for example, if you have 10 people, it's 10 multiplied by 10 minus one, which is nine. So 90 divided by two. So there are 45 channels of communication that you will have if you are having 10 people in a project team. So somebody who's answered it, thank you very much for that. Right. Moving on to the next one. So as, if this is an extension of what we were talking about. You know, this is how the Scrum team looks, the Scrum board looks, uh, you know, how you actually, uh, you know, do a storyboard. What are the to do things? Uh, what's in progress? What's to be verified? What's, what's done, et cetera. What, what are the features in design? What is the module design? Where are the payment gateways? Who's the admin control system? Uh, what are the feature designs? You know, what is the overall consumer experience that would separate this MFN company, the furniture company from its competitor in e-commerce? So how can we make it happen as a project team? How can we make it better than the competitor? So that's the objective, uh, which basically is set by the product owner and executed by the scrum team. So this is basically, you know, giving you a, a flavor, a flair of what's going on inside the scrum room. Moving on. Yeah, so finally, as you can see, the product is coming out. This is the e-commerce site on your right that has come out of all the work of the scrum team and it's still in development, the layout, the design and all of that. So as you can see there's banners, uh, there's blogs, there's customer feedbacks, there's a gallery of images, et cetera. So this is a product that is in development still. And the client gives a feedback, of course, how it is, should it be changed something, something needs to be tweaked, different color combinations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in terms of customer experience, it should be tested. So for example, now you can uh, do uh, A-B testing. So before launching a particular product, you can do a, a version or a B version or challenger version and find out where the customer experience is better. So all those things uh, can be done in a very, very agile fashion by deploying Scrum. So this is an example of a Scrum team developing the product and the loop is being completed by the client giving his feedback. Moving on. So that's a module design, nothing much to show here. It's fairly not a very good uh, output, but this is a system output. Then moving on. The next one. Yeah, at this particular point in time, I was thinking we'll run a small poll before I talk about the last slide in the case study. Yeah, so a group has been talking with us, recreating the Agile Manifesto. What is the most important personal trait that needs to be represented in that group. Please give your perspectives. You have got 10 to 12 seconds. Please give your point of view. Right, so we'll move on again. 
You can close the poll now. Right. Can you go back one slide? Right. This is the final process, final finished process. The e-commerce product backlog which came from the product manager or the product owner, got transferred into the sprint backlog. Then they went into a seven to eight week sprint. Every day they had a daily scrum to basically tweak the product. And then at the end of it, they had a shippable product for the customer's feedback, right? And this is the advantage of the scrum process. It's, it's you know, you do just enough planning. And then you build the product with everybody's perspective and client is constantly kept in loop to ensure that at the end of it all, you don't deliver the wrong product. And that's the essence of Scrum. Okay, moving on. Yeah, so that's the final site, you know, that the team produced. Uh, and that probably was the end of the project, but not, not really the end of the project before you close the project. So let's look at it, what you did to close the project. This is a final e-commerce site. So uh, what was still required was to train the staff to ensure they're completely up to speed. Uh, the stakeholder feedback analysis uh, was taken. Uh, the handling, handing over ceremony was very important when it was given over from the project team to the client side. Support of maintenance and e-marketing. But most importantly, before you close, close a project, it's important to document. It's very important to document the key learnings and archive them so that in the next project, you can probably use those, right? So that was uh, a small case study and give you a flair of what project management e-commerce may look like. Coming back to the Middle East and North Africa. So as you can see that this is the next chart that talks about, you know, what the e-commerce is going to be. The last slide was, similar slide was about what the, the you know what the industry is doing today but this is what the industry is going to be in 2022 so on the right hand top side the industry is going to be 28.5 billion dollars next year a jump of 8 billion dollars from this year it's billion yeah not million so it's a massive jump and look at the change in e-commerce penetration down ua from 4.2 percent is becoming 13 percent saudi arabia from 3.8 percent to be becoming 8 percent GCC from three to becoming 12%, massive jumps. It's an explosion. This industry is actually exploding. So just imagine the amount of jobs that are, going to, that, that are going to be created around this particular industry. So that's the point we want to you know, make in this particular slide that with the right fundamentals in place, and they're going to be because Amazon has hit the market, they're going to transform the market and disrupt the market. Middle East and North Africa, e-commerce space is expected to grow up to two times its current size. Yeah, and I thought it's interesting to speak about, you know, five future e-commerce trends in our region where we live in. We're not living in China or in the US or Western Europe. We're living in the Middle East and things could be different. Uh, personalization and customer engagement is gonna be very, very key in retail shopping uh, e-commerce stores because the customers in the Middle East are used to souk in the original days, and then they got used to Carrefour and Lulu and, you know, uh, uh, in Saudi, let's say they, they have got uh, the Vola Group, uh, Hyperpanda, etc. So people are used to shopping offline, face to face. They want to touch and feel the product before they actually adopt it. E-commerce, you have to bring in all those experiences virtually. This, this involves a lot of personalization. That's the first point. And a follow up point to that is a lot of artificial intelligence, a lot of assistance, a lot of chatbots are going to invent the e-commerce space. A lot of robots will be there in e-commerce stores, uh, which are basically going to take away the human intervention at that level to ensure and improve the consumer experience. A lot of B2B e-commerce will come in, which means that not only the Amazon to people like you and me who buy there, not only B2C, but also companies will start transacting with each other via e-commerce. So that's going to happen too. There's going to be interactive product visualization, you know, better product visualization inside Noon, inside Amazon, etc. Carphone now are going to happen. You're going to actually visualize the product better than you do today. 
Uh, what's going to happen for the brand? From the brand standpoint, the brands are going to invest a lot in demand generation activities, meaning not just selling to Amazon, but actually going inside Amazon and boosting the products in terms of uh, by investing in products like Amazon PPC, Amazon DSP. So let's say if you're just selling a garment inside Amazon, uh, everybody is selling as well. So how can you differentiate yourself? How can you bring more traffic to uh, you know onto the Amazon site? by investing in Amazon PPC, Amazon DSP, these are particular products inside Amazon, which can help you boost your traffic. And finally, most of all, project management will play a pivotal role in e-commerce trends in 2021. So that would mean that if you register to a course like what's provided by LUBM, uh, you would be in a very, very uh, you know, advantageous position when uh, folks are looking for project managers uh, for these large companies. So that's a very important takeaway in my opinion. Moving on to what is the industry looking for? So we spoke to some recruiters in the e-commerce industry and what are they looking for in terms of e-commerce uh, project managers? So look, let, I'm not reading everything here. You can read it. We can just pause for like 30 seconds and you can read the points, uh, but uh, you will see a lot of project management skills that we already spoke about are already required or heavily in demand um, by the recruiters who are looking for you every day in LinkedIn, for example. They're constantly looking for people who have the right skills for these jobs. Moving on, next, next slide. Yeah, so they're continuous, it's continuing. So the different skills that people are looking for, the recruiters are looking for, the industry is looking for, hiring the project managers in the e-commerce domain. Take five, six seconds to read through it. You will have the deck from LUBM guys. Next. Right. This is an important one, the typical skill profile. So what are they looking for? The, the project management and the e-commerce is a fairly new business in the Middle East. So looking at three years plus experience, plus be a team player, strong understanding of e-commerce trends and best practices. And you can you know, get that, all of that is available in Google. Uh, and from this deck as well, you can contact me directly also if you want to get more information. Strong background in digital and e-commerce marketing. Uh, you don't need to be a specialist. But as an e-commerce manager, you've got to be conscious of the key digital transformation practices. Good interpersonal skills, uh, excellent verbal and written communication, strong problem-solving skills, uh, detail-oriented, and qualifications like the Master's in Project Management, which is being discussed right now by the university, or a PMP qualification, a Prince2, uh, a Scrum Master. Uh, all of these things are highly desired. So... That's about it. I would say that's all of the content that I had to share with you today. I hope you uh, enjoyed listening to me as much as I enjoyed presenting it to you. So thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. If you have any questions, you can either direct at me or another person. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, uh, Pro Professor Shom. Not and... yet, but <laughs> not yet a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, for us in in academia, we sure. we anyone who imparts education is uh, as good as a professor. So thank you very much uh, for your insights, and especially uh, the most important uh, aspect that you covered are the skills which are in demand. What does the job market look like? And I would also like to share with you that in my earlier university, I was heading placements. And as you rightly uh, emphasized on the growing uh, job sector, especially in the Middle East and the world over, these are certain skills which are constantly in demand. I was in uh, constant uh, contact with the recruiters as well as the uh, you know, unit heads, and they specifically require these kind of skills. Um, I would like to invite uh, you know, the attendees in case they have any questions, uh, which which you would want to raise at this point. Uh, you know, Professor Shom is with us and he would be taking, uh, and he would be responding to these questions.
Also, please note in case if you have questions for Dr. Stain, uh, Dr. Rekha also, please do not hesitate to raise it on this forum or write to us. Rest assured, we will respond to you in a week's time, uh, you know, about your question and what is their response on the same. It's transformation from absolutely nothing but extensive deserts to one of the most 21st century and modern countries on planet Earth is excellent and astounding. Over the past few decades, we have witnessed barren tracts of lands being covered with tall and needle-like skyscrapers. Every part of the world is in a constant state of development, advancement, and growth. Progress in technology and research shows direct relation with projects becoming more complex and vaster. Their accomplishment from a dream into a reality has only been possible because of the fine vigilance of project managers. Lincoln University of Business and Management is one fine institution that produces exemplary and skilled project managers under the watch of experienced and technology updated teaching faculty aspiring project managers here challenge their potential and caliber all in all projects ranging from small scale to most complex and large infrastructure demand a professional project managers view a project manager from LUBM is valuable and marketable owing to the expertise and realistic strategies it offers Um, Mr. Shom, we have got a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Uh, can I can I uh, raise it now? You're you're on mute. Yes. yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, one question uh, from Mr. Arthur here is: What are the benefits of e-commerce in today's modern economy? Right, a great question. So as I was mentioning about it, e-commerce uh, is, you know, has been around for a while, at least for the last 20 years elsewhere in the world. But I would, I would answer in context of the region that we live in, right, uh, which is the MEA region. And, uh, you know, uh, over, over here, there's a huge area. First of all, MEA is a large geography. And to cover the geography, you know, e-commerce is a perfect vehicle to actually satisfy the customer needs in terms of products and services that they would like to buy and fulfill. And uh, that's a reason why probably large players like Amazon has taken a position in the Middle East. So e-commerce has truly revolutionized the way the customer journeys are being made today. And uh, that's probably in a nutshell, uh, you know, it's bottom up. E-commerce has come out of customer behavior. The customer behavior actually has created this industry. So it's very bottom up and it's going to see explosive growth in next five to 10 years. Sure, I understand. Uh, there is also another question from uh, someone in HR and uh, uh, the person is interested if project management program would be helpful to someone in a non-project uh, uh, kind of a role. So what's your opinion? Right. So project management is not function specific. You know, as we were talking about it, whether you're in HR, whether you're in finance, whether you are in uh, supply chain, uh, it, is not, it is not a functional skill. But project management is a strategic skill that helps you deliver results within scope, time and cost, right? We spoke about that. So whether you're in HR, you, you, for example, in HR, I'll give you an example of an HR project. So human resource is now earlier, they were recruiting, uh, you know, just by placing an ad, right? But now all of the human resource companies have an application track, tracking system. It's called an ATS, right? They have all of those deployed. You just don't send, uh, you still send a response on LinkedIn, but you basically apply in an ATS. And ATS helps the HR people sort the applicants, right, from thousands of applications that are coming in. So to deploy an ATS system in human resource calls for a significant amount of project management skills. So that's in short how to answer the question. So it's not linked to your profession, but it's yeah. how you can execute your role better, more efficiently, being in any role. Agreed. Yes. Um, Mr. Fredel uh, here has a question. And um, 
he's keen on understanding as to how one can or the management measures the success of a project right so for example uh every project will have certain kpis right and the kpis are revolving around the triangle of triple constraints that we spoke about right so there is cost there is scope and there is time and the heart of every project management is the quality the quality with which you deliver the particular project so all of these things have a measurement so uh, in project management jargons there is earn value calculation that you can do to find out there is cost variation there is schedule variation uh, there is cost performing index there is schedule performing index these are different kpis by which a management measures uh, a project success but ultimately a project also has impact on company's pnl so top line gross margins bottom line uh, and all of that so it also has a pnl impact so uh, it can be is easily measured agreed Uh, Brenda, with us here, has a question: If all the projects have to reach a break-even point in order to be viable, uh, it need not be. For example, if you're doing a, a non-profit project, if you're working with UNHCR, for example, yes. or for example, if you're working with Global Food Program, now these are not, uh, you know, they 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 have a deeper sense of purpose. they're not just about making money or making profit or expanding margins etc so uh, yeah need not be they need not have a break even point but if it's a, a work for a profit organization a multinational enterprise etc there definitely would be a break even analysis it has to be done but if it is done for a non profit organization projects are done both at non profit as well as profit organizations so that's a perspective yeah right um uh ds ray uh, from the audience would like to understand the difference between project management and operations management fundamental difference right so as we were speaking about uh, you know project management is a unique endeavor project management is something for example we spoke about a project uh, let's say implementing sap system in your right. supply chain that would be a project management because it's got a starting point and end point and it's got certain benefits that it's going to confer on the supply chain team it's going to make the supply chain team more efficient more productive and more profitable for the organization whereas in operations would be like processing an order so you get an order from a customer you process the order give it to the warehouse and the warehouse fulfills it that's what you do on a daily basis that's the operation part but and you take any unique endeavor that's going to impact the company's bottom line that's typically the hallmark of a project yes and and more so i feel that you know operations management is something that is more continuous in nature it always continues right. while project has a start and a certain end date as well right um someone has a very interesting question felix it is and felix wants to know how um environmentalism can be incorporated into project management very good question so uh, you know sustainability is a key part of uh, strategies of large organizations you know they are understanding that it's not just about making profit it's about also contributing to the larger society and to do that it's very important that we get in uh, in project management early on the essential ingredients of sustainability like carbon neutrality you know uh, using uh, less water etc etc so whatever project it is you look at the the carbon footprint of that particular project will it have a large carbon footprint uh, from the very beginning once you study that you should be able to figure out how we can mitigate it if not completely remove it how we can lessen it so how we can how can we be better corporate citizens as a corporation how can we employ the project management sustainably sustainably had to become a more agile uh, more uh, respectable corporate citizen rather than just uh, wrecking in profits so it's very important to uh, you know it's a great question first of all brilliant yeah. yes corporate governance is now taken and being discussed a lot in board rooms today right um, i am uh, merging two questions from uh, two attendees um, mr arafat and mr hasan 
Mr. Arafat would like to understand if e-commerce is needed in all kinds of business. And Mr. Hassan has, uh, you know, something connected to the question is uh, probably in the country where he is, uh, he wants to know if the dollar rate is changing, is it worth starting an e-commerce business? Right. Uh, relevant questions. So e-commerce is again, born out of end user requirement. If the end user has all the resources, you know, if, if you are in a country where there's uh, low internet penetration, no mobile, uh, low mobile penetration, uh, there's no 4G or 3G, the speed of internet is low, credit card penetration is low. So if you have these situation in particular countries, then e-commerce is probably not viable yet because these are the essential ingredients or infrastructure that are required to run an e-commerce operation. So it will completely depend on the environment of that particular country, but also it will uh, depend on how the consumers would like to buy. So one has to ask consumers, how would they like to buy the product? The reason why we're talking about e-commerce is because it's come down from the consumers and I'm reiterating it and emphasizing it and underlining it because e-commerce has come into focus because of the consumers. The second point was about the dollar rate, right? Yes. So it's talking about the Forex. So if you're buying from a particular country that is uh, producing a product in dollar, and if you're selling in dollars, then uh, that impact is mitigated. But let's say if you are buying in US dollars and if you're selling in Turkish Lira, for example, mm -hmm. then you can have a problem because that's a depreciating currency. You know, in the last six years or seven years, the currency is significantly depreciated. That would mean you have to bring up your price you know, every time the currency, local currency depreciates, there's going to be a significant impact on the PL of the business. And this only means that they have to raise the price, which uh, may not be, you know, possible all the time. So if somebody's starting a business, it might just make sense to procure locally and sell locally yes. to understand, uh, especially if you are having, if you're in a country with, which has fluctuating currency situation. So uh, that's the point. Uh, best to do local e-commerce first, source locally and sell locally before going international. So that's the point I want to make here. I believe, and it's my assumption that Mr. Hassan must be from Egypt, uh, if I'm not wrong. And uh, I will just take a final question and uh, uh, audience, please uh, rest assured that all your questions will be taken uh, to Professor Shom, to Dr. Rekha or Dr. Stain, uh, whomever you want to direct to, we will address all of your questions. Um, what Le Didon uh, has a question here. What are the monitoring measures or standards controlling the quality of products which are put out in the market? Right, good question. So I have some background in product management. So uh, in UAE and Saudi Arabia, for example, let's say Saudi Arabia, that's a large country in our region that we live in. So Saudi Arabia has something called SASO. So every product that has to enter or cross Saudi customs will have to comply with something called SASO. Uh, so it basically is a standard that governs different kinds of products. Uh, it's not, I don't think it's about the food product, but all the non-food products are governed by SASO. So the e-commerce companies are very careful about it. So if you have to do e-commerce business in Saudi Arabia, all the products that are going to be listed in the e-commerce operation must comply with SASO, SASO. Yeah. All right. So we have a lot more questions, but I would request uh, my team to please note these down and uh, we will be reverting to individual uh, attendees on, on their questions, which are very, very relevant. All Thank right. You. Thanks Thank you for having me and I really enjoyed it thoroughly. Take care and all the best. Our pleasure. All right, uh, team, thank you very much for being a wonderful audience. I look forward to having you in our class. You have already got a glimpse of the session, how it is going to be. Um, and I know that a lot of you have asked what is the difference between a certification and how does it vary an MBA in project management, whereas, uh, you know, how is MSc in project management more relevant to you? Um, 
the difference, uh, what I understand is that MBA gives you a lot more business relevant skills, more leadership, more uh, HR skills. However, MSc in project management, besides these management skills, also reinforces a lot of project management skills, which are only and only related to your domain, which is project management. So uh, that is my take on the difference. Uh, we do have MBA in project management as well. Uh, as you see, we have quite a few partners that we are associated with. Largely, we are associated with UK public universities like University of West of Scotland, York St. John University. So we do have an MBA program in project management as well. But the difference between these two programs is that uh, there are a lot more general business management skills offered in an MBA. And if you want, if you are a thorough project management uh, specialist, then you must apply for MSc in project management, right? Uh, so thank you for being with us. Uh, it was a pleasure and you will get a similar taste. These are hands-on skills that you will be developing in the class and these are readily applicable in your workplace tomorrow. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening or rest of your day. I know you start your weekend today, so make most of it and keep learning. Thank you from Team Lincoln. Bye-bye.